Okay, very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us this evening for a Mind in Life Europe Mind Matters talk. This is not just the final talk in this particular series, but it's also the final talk of 2022 in our online programming. And it's also the final talk in um, the umbrella theme that we've had for 2022 at Mind in Life Europe, which has been standing at the edge. And so we're really delighted to welcome Martine Batchelor to offer a talk whose um, theme will be hinting at that umbrella theme, Standing at the Edge. And the title of her talk will be The Art of Meditative Listening and Speaking While Standing at the Edge. So Martine Batchelor uh, lived in Korea for many years as a nun under the guidance of Master Kusan for 10 years. She's the author of Let Go, A Buddhist Guide to Breaking Free of Habits. She's a member of the Gaia House Teacher Council. She teaches meditation retreats worldwide, and she lives in France near Bordeaux. Her latest works are What Is This? Ancient Questions for Modern Minds and the Definition, Practice, and Psychology of Vedana. Recently, she's been involved with the Silver Santé study, teaching meditation, mindfulness, and compassion to seniors in France to see if this could prevent aging decline. So I think many of you are, are familiar already with Martine's work, and um, we're really delighted to be able to host her this evening for a talk. And I think she'd like to start us out with a brief uh, meditation at the very beginning. So we're happy to give you the floor, Martine. Thank you for joining us. So uh, welcome, and um, I am very happy to be with you uh, this evening. And so what I like to do is to start with uh, a, a short two, three minutes of meditation and a little bit on the theme. So the theme for this evening in part is going to be listening. And there is this meditation on just listening to sound, listening to the music of life. So I would like to suggest that we find a comfortable posture, that it be sitting, standing, lying down, whatever suits you. And then gently just opening ourselves to the sound of the world being aware of sounds as they rise and as they pass away. And I will start with the sound of the bell. So we are just listening without defining, without expecting, just waiting for sounds to happen. And if there are no sound, listening to the silent, to the hum of the silent. When we listen mindfully, we can focus on the space in which the sounds happen, or we can focus of, on any specific sound that might arise.
not rejecting any sound, not grasping at any sound. So this evening, I want to look at different things which for me comes together. So meditation, and in a way, how can meditation help us when we stand at the edge? And what does it mean to stand at the edge? Because standing at the edge could mean that we really are facing very difficult times like some of us are doing, or standing at the edge could mean that we are open to some creative moment, to some creative potential. So really looking at meditation in terms of that, also looking at listening, meditative listening in terms of that, and of course, speaking. So we'll see how much time I have. So in a way, when we meditate, what is it that we do? To me, this is kind of, I am a meditation teacher. So over time, this is one of the questions, in a way, I ask myself, what is it that we do? So really, in terms of what is going on, what are we doing, and what is the effect of doing this? And so I would say what we do is actually we cultivate two qualities that we already have, but we're going to develop them more. The first one is anchoring. And anchoring, focusing is, not all meditation do that, but in quite a few meditation, you are suggested to focus on an object in your experience. It could be the breath, it could be the body, here it could be the sound, it can be loving kindness, a quality, etc. And here, when we do anchoring in this way on an object in the experience, actually, I would say four things happen. So you sit in meditation, Maybe you focus on the breath or on the sound. And what you might notice very quickly is that generally you think of something else, your attention goes somewhere else, and then generally you suggest it. It suggested come back to the breath. Then you go again, then come back to the breath. And actually the aim of that exercise is not because the breath is more sacred than anything else. And it also doesn't mean we have to stay with the breath all the time. But what is important is actually the fact that we make the choice to come back in a friendly way to the breath. And if we do this again and again, what it changes is that it helps us to move from repetition, from being habitual. And I think this is a little bit what might happen when we stand at the edge, is that often we might actually react from a place of repetitive habits. So more from a place of reactivity than a place of creativity. And if we come back again and again, when we meditate in this way, 
I would say four things happen. The first one is you do not feed the habit. Because if you sit in meditation for any length of time, you might have noticed that generally you don't have original thought. You don't think something you have never thought before. Generally, it's kind of a very similar thought, planning, ruminating, daydreaming, or it's something in the past, something in the future. And so it's kind of, in a way, we go over again and again the same material. And so when we come back to the breath or to listening, we're actually not feeding the habits, we're dissolving its power, and then it can bring us back to the creative function of feeling, thinking, sensing, relating. And to me, when we stand at the edge, this is one of the really important quality that we can bring to ourselves, develop in ourselves is that creative function. So that when we stand at the edge, there is this creativity instead of being fixed and kind of repeating in a way the same thing. So either we're very worried because we are at the edge or we might not be as creative as we could be and there's suddenly this very special, challenging, possibly full of possibility moment. And the false thing that happened when we come back again and again and again is the fact that each time we come back to this experience. And so again, when we are lost in a thought, in a feeling, in a sensation, we're actually lost in a kind of a narrow bend of our experience. Everything disappears. You might be sitting here, but you could be 10 years ago, you could be five years hence, you could be totally somewhere else. And so when we come back to the breath or to the sounds, we come back to the whole experience. And again, it seems to me that when we stand at the edge of any situation, we need to have the wider perspective that we can have. Otherwise, we're going to come to it with quite a limited, fixed way of reacting instead of creatively responding. And so in a way, this anchoring element of the meditation is helping us to develop calm and spaciousness. And then you have the other aspect of meditation, which is questioning, exploring. So it's really using the brightness of the mind, which we can then apply to the situation at hand and to see in terms of the meditation, what we really encourage. And I think that's why meditative listening I find is so useful is to become more aware organically of change, that things change. Because one of our more main reaction, which is fairly routine, is it's always like this. It will never change. And I don't think this way of being can really help us when we stand at the edge. And so in a way, through the meditation, especially through the listening meditation, so <clears throat> through the listening meditation, one thing you generally become aware is that sounds arise and pass away. Or even if they continue, if you go inside the sound, they change within themselves. And so through that, the meditation makes us be really aware of things change, instead of us having this tendency to permanentize. And it makes us more to be in a way at the micro level of things changing, shifting. 
And then this makes us in a way more in tune with the two aspects of change. Because one of the aspects of change is what I would call ultimate change, which is death. And how can, in a way, awareness of death help us standing at the edge? And I think it makes us aware of the preciousness of life, but also it brings with it compassion for this preciousness of life. My teacher in Korea used to say, your life rests upon a single breath. So what are you going to do now? And I really felt this when I saw my father die. I saw his last breath. One moment he was breathing, next he was not. And at that time, this great compassion arose to everything that lives. And it in a way totally changed my relationship with my mother. Instead of relating to her with ancient history we had, in a very fixed, habitual way, I suddenly saw her as this person whose life rests upon a single breath. And so in a way, whenever I meet her, I am with her, I am with this person in this moment, not with the history we might have had. So in a way, the compassion arising from really being aware of change, but also the other aspect of change is the gift of change and the fact that something can change. To me, this is a great gift because again, we might fix ourselves, but worse, we might fix other. And we might say to somebody, you will never change. You will always be like this. I mean, my, Husband Stephen Batchelor was written many books. He actually did not get his diploma from high school. He failed. And when at the end of the year, the headmaster kind of shook hands with everybody, kind of, and then when he kind of saw Stephen, he thought he told him he kind of had a limb shaking with Stephen and he said, Bachelor. I don't think you will ever amount to anything. And that's not what happened. <laughs> Stephen's life kind of changed in many different ways. He was not stuck as possibly not a great student, but afterward he could study in many different ways. So in a way, there is this danger of fixing ourselves fixing our potential, fixing other potential. And so in a way, the gift of change, so we kind of, we become more and more aware, sounds change. And it's interesting, you hear a bird, twing, 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 and you think, mm, I want it to continue. I want it again, and then nothing happened. Or you hear the sound of an engine, and you want it to stop right now. But it's so interesting, kind of once I was in the garden and there was this really, really, really noise, huge noise. And then I went inside the noise to be aware of its changing nature. And the sound was amazing, very different. So it's very interesting also to see perception, how our perception influence how we experience anything and change. So in a way, the gift of change, the potential for transformation, especially when we stand at the edge. And the other aspect of this questioning, exploring, is conditionality, that things arise upon conditions. And again, with sound, is so interesting, kind of like you listen to sounds, and then very quickly, you have a perception. This is a bird, it's great, this is this, not so great. 
And what I found so interesting during the COVID, I mean, COVID was, uh, of course, a terrible time. But at another level, I felt it changed a lot of our perception. And one of the perception it changed for me was listening to cars when I was meditating. So I sit, even though I'm a little village, I am next to a road. So if I sit in meditation, I hear the car passing by. And then generally cars, you think, be nice to be kind of silence when you meditate, whatever. And then during COVID, you had so few cars that suddenly I thought, ah, oh, somebody is in a car. Maybe they're going to, maybe they're a nurse. Maybe they're kind of going to repair some electrical problem. Maybe they're doing this, they're doing that. And suddenly you saw people in cars in a very different ways that ah, cars, noise. And so in a way to see how being aware of conditions, seeing in a way the bigger picture can again open in terms of compassion that the person has the possibility to change and also open in terms of perception, bringing kind of like a more compassionate perception. So in a way, the anchoring and the questioning, helping us to develop a creative, wise, compassionate awareness. And I would say this awareness has two aspects. One is acceptance. It helps you to see more fully what is going on and what is it I need to accept because it's there. But what is it I can transform? And I think when we are at the edge, is often a question we ask ourselves. Should I just accept what's going on? Or what is it I can transform about what's going on? And how can I transform it in a wise and compassionate way? This for me would be a big question. So in a way, it's kind of really about our creative potential. How can it flourish? How can it respond? Then now I want to look at meditative listening. So you, have, you might have heard about different meditation. So meditation on the breath is very well known. You also have meditation on the body, body scanning. But we also have the meditation, like I suggested in the little meditation intro of just listening to sound and noticing how it's a different kind of focus, a different kind of anchor. Because when we focus on ourselves, the breath, the body, then it's a little personal in a way. And to some degree, especially with the breath, there is a little control. With the sound, immediately the anchor, the focus, is more wide open. And actually what you cultivate there is impersonal because you wait for the sound of the world to happen. Receptivity, you're receptive to what's going to come to you. And also you cultivate being with what is unpredictable. Because in a way I would say for me, standing at the edge is also standing with what is unpredictable. In a way, we never know what's going to happen. We also never know how we're going to be with what's going to happen, but hopefully the meditation, the listening will help us when what's going to happen, happen. Nobody could have predicted, I mean, some people might have some time ago predicted COVID, but nobody could predict it in the way in a way it happens or all kinds of other things which happen. So in a way, listening meditation is being with what is impersonal, being with what is unpredictable. And in a way, opening to something beyond us. I think to me, this is something so important that when we cultivate meditation, 
when we kind of uh, study the mind, et cetera, et cetera, there is not just about us, but it's really about all of us, not just about me, but about us, about us in life. So to me, listening meditation is really listening to the music of life. And in a way, dissolving as much as we can up to a certain degree, in a way, what we prefer. It becomes very obvious what we prefer in terms of sound, but can we listen to sound as sound? And then, of course, creatively engage with them. I think this is, of course, very important. So really listening to the sound for themselves. So in a way we're moving because often we listen to a sound. I like it, I don't like it. It reminds me of this or that and another. Can we just listen to the sound without any reference to us, but to the sound itself, just listening to it as it happens. In the same way that when we are with someone else, can we be with that person for the person themselves? And not, this is about me, and through the person, actually, this is about me, and not about them. To me, listening is kind of slightly trying to move a little our position, to be like the center of the universe, to can I be part of the universe in kind of this listening meditation? Then in turn of, so that's listening to the sound. And so that becomes a practice which we can then bring to listening to others. Because I think this is kind of an important part of life of working together, of sharing together, of connecting together is this listening and speaking. And then there is a question, how do I listen? And I would say generally we listen in three different ways. First way, I listen to the person while I am thinking of what I'm going to say, which is so much more important. And then I listen in, within that you have three things which happen. You listen to the person once, sir. You think about what you're going to say, which is so much more important once, sir. And you wait for them to stop once, sir. It's kind of fascinating when we listen like that. Next way, we look in the right direction. So we look to the person, they're speaking, and we think about something else. We think about the shopping list, we think about yesterday, we think about really something else. And then when the person asks us, what do you think? We have no idea what they say. And here, this is very interesting in terms of hopefully your conscious, meaning your life, hopefully your ear are working. I hope for you, your ear are working and you did not hear, which means you were not aware. And that's what we cultivate in meditation being aware for its own sake, being present, being here. Then the third way we listen, we listen and we grasp at what is being said, and then we amplify it and often don't help the situation. And in a way, what I would suggest is that we do meditative, creative, wise listening. So that when you speak with someone, when they speak, you totally listen to them. Totally listen, fully listen. To me, this is one of the gifts we can give to another is to totally listen to them. And when they stop, often you will be surprised by what you say is so much more appropriate and relevant because a connection has been made. And through that connection, your potential can creatively engage with what the person said. And so to me, this is kind of like something beautiful we can cultivate when we are standing at the edge with others. How are we doing that together? 
in a way which is creative, in a way which is responsive. And then another one in terms of like, I want to move from listening to maybe more daily life, what do we listen to? Generally, we listen to words. And then the question is, how do we listen to words? What is our kind of like, how do we relate to words, to what's being said? And first, let's look at what is a word. A word is just a little sonorous wave. So in itself, the word is empty because as soon as I say it, it's gone. The word is not sticking in the air. All what I said up to now is not sticking anywhere. There is space. The word does not stick anywhere. But when you sit in meditation and you try to be aware of the breath or the sound, suddenly you remember ago he said this how could he say this and then you plot revenge and next time I meet the person I'm going to get them or whatever well this is so interesting the word is gone it was gone as soon as it was said but we still keep it and so here I think with this creative wise listening can we have this creative, wise engagement with words? And ask ourselves when we hear a word, is this about me or not? Is it appropriate or not? What can I do about this word? What can I do about what I am hearing? And so this, I think, is kind of really part of our practice in daily life especially standing at the edge when one can feel a little kind of agitated. And this is something to, to be careful about. The meditation is to help us to be grounded, to be clear, so that when there is a challenging or difficult situation, we can bring some calm, some clarity to it. So really be kind of noticing when I hear something, what do I do with it? Especially, I mean, nowadays you have listening to TV. Another thing nowadays, you don't listen, but you see from the social media, whatever you read, how much we are influenced by it in positive way and in negative way. And I think when we're standing at the edge, we really have to creatively engage with world we listen to, of we words we read. Then you could say, before you even speak, there are words in your mind, there are thoughts in your mind. And I think in a way the meditative, creative listening or speaking can help us a little to reflect how the languaging in the mind becomes the languaging I use with someone else. And how am I with that languaging? And here I'm looking a little bit at when we discuss, like if you stand at the edge, you generally with others, you want to discuss things, what do we do? How are we going to do it? What's going to happen? Da, da, da. What can we do? And then it's very interesting because one of you might say, it's like this, we must do that. Oh no, it's like that, we have to do this. But here I find it's something we really have to be careful about. So you are with somebody, you're discussing whatever subject, and then the person suggests something. And you might say, mm, I don't think so. And then often the person then kind of says something else, a little kind of in reply, a little charge, and then you say something a little charge too. And what happens then? 
what happens then is generally we think this is a thought I have, this is a good thought I have, this is the right thought, this is the best thought, this is the only one everybody must believe it. We really have to see how we could have a good thought, creative thought or not, and how we actually grasp at it and define ourselves with our thought. So if we are our thought, our view, and when we suggest any thought or any view to someone else and someone else and the other person say, I don't agree. I mean, they don't agree with your thought, but for you, you might feel they're questioning your very self. And I think we have to be very careful there between something becoming an argument and something becoming a dialogue. And this is something to me that when we stand at the edge, we have to be very careful. Are we going into argument? And generally we're going to get stuck and a little aggressive, or are we going into dialogue when actually the two persons conditions different condition, different thought, different potential coming together are going to have actually a more creative synthesis, something both of them separately could not think together, together could come to something very different. And so in a way, when we look at listening, when we look at words, how can we cultivate this really creative, wise, compassionate listening, compassionate speaking? So this is what I wanted to talk now, and then to kind of invite uh, the discussion. Martin, thank you so much. This was a phenomenal, very deep, very concrete teaching. We, we needed uh, at this point in time, I, I'm sure. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion with uh, our friends here who are attending this, this course. So please feel free to raise your hand or ask a question in the chat and then share it live. And we are open now for questions. Who would like to start? We are still in the mode of listening to to your to your wisdom, Martin. Leila, please. Thank you, Martina, for the teaching. Mm. Even though it's late evening and I was really trying to fully listen, I was feeling how tiredness was pulling me out. Um, what you said about the three ways of listening was I deeply resonated in me uh, because I, I work in the context of the university uh, in an honors program. And often we're having class discussions, right, with the students. And I feel that we even teach mostly arguing and debating as opposed to listening. And I want to ask you an advice. How can I explain to students the value of listening and the value of dialogue as opposed to arguing? And just to add to the context, they are future lawyers. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, uh, in a way, uh, if if they were working with uh, reparation and justice, you know, you have a certain kind of like justice where actually the thing is about the victim and the person they meet together, then I think you could really talk to them about this uh, cooperation. But lawyers, um, yeah, it's so sad in a way that law has become such in a way kind of like uh, uh, a fighting, like each is going to fight. And so you have to kind of uh, really uh, damage the other person. 
I mean, it's really sad. So I don't know, because <laughs> in a way, yes, you would kind of encourage, encourage them to have like really ethical, wise listening, wise speaking. And when, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the training will be about finding kind of what can really, in a way, uh, destroy the person. So, so yeah, no, no, I'm not saying it's an impossible task, but it's kind of like what would be interesting would be in class to have to kind of maybe look at, of course, you could say, yes, that's the way we can do it, thinking about argument, but how would be in terms of an, as an experiment to think of law in terms of dialogue? How would it be? And so kind of in a way to use your own creativity and their own creativity and time to time to have a little session which would be more about dialogue. How can dialoguing together, can we get to a higher solution, so to speak? I wonder if as an exercise, it would be okay. Poss possibly as part of the class plan, I'm not sure <laughs> if it would work out. Thank you, Lala. Uh, Aida. Yeah, thank you, Martin. And thank you, Emily, for doing this again. Um, this is just a comment. I met a, a lawyer actually at a retreat with uh, Stephen, Stephen Batchelor. And this lawyer said that he's trying to change his language when writing. So I think listening and speaking is one thing, but writing is also very much connected with language, of course. So he's writing his contracts, his all his emails in a very meditative way. And I thought this is really interesting. And he tried to bring the writing out of a jargon. Um, so the kind of making a jargon free and make it really understandable and more from a we perspective than from an I perspective. And I just wanted to mention this and I think um, writing emails is such a good practice too. So I personally find it really helpful to not send the email right away after I've written it, but reread it and reread it and maybe leave it a little bit and think about it and read it again. So this is all practice, I think, and language is so important. And so we have to be so sensitive and sensible with language. Thank you. No, exactly. I so totally, I think, email is i mean nowadays we do a lot of email before it was letters now it's email and because email is so fast we have the tendency i mean i am somebody who generally try to write the least i can as i am a writer then this is my job so when i write email i try to be the shortest i can and then i realize hmm but maybe how is a person going to feel to get this kind of like telegram like email? It's not going to be kind of very kind of nice. So now part of my job, as you said, my practice is to how can I send possibly a short email, but with a little more kind of considering the other person saying, hello, how are you? And this and that. So that's what I do for regular email. But I also totally agree with you in terms of when you want to write an email, which might be difficult email. So you could say, you know, you kind of mm, a little kind of edgy, kind of like, you know, there is some difficulty or there is something. And then what I do is like you said, I think about it and I don't write it. Then I think a little again about it, I don't write it. And I do about three or four times. And then when I come to write, I write it and then I always reread it. I never send an email I have not read at least two or three times to make sure, you know, is it okay? How is it going to be felt when it's received? It's not just about me writing something, but it's kind of like any language is how is the other person going to feel when they receive it? So no, very much thank you for your comment.
Thank you, Aida. Any further questions or comments? Yes, please feel free to jump in, anyone. Lela again, please. No. If it's okay. To absolutely, ask. absolutely. I am, uh, Martina, the difference that you said from the breath meditation to the listening was very insightful for me. It really, it really, I don't know, resonated that, okay, there is this opening. And I'm curious of the involving other senses and what is your experience? Can it be done in the same way, meditative seeing and just um, even engaging smell? I'm just curious of the other senses and what are the consequences of working through the other senses? No, personally, I'm very interested in that. And so, because it's kind of connected, you know, when you be, you can be aware of the breath, of the body, of the sound. And then you can be aware of the contact and then be aware of the tonality of pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And so I would say that when we sit in meditation, generally I would suggest the breath, the body, the sound, a quality like loving kindness. So keep it in it simple because you are sitting still, not much is going on generally. But then when you do walking meditation, and especially if you do walking meditation, then that's what I suggest. As you walk, being aware of contact through the eyes, because that's something that so influenced us. We see something immediately, I like it, I don't like it. This person is like this, I not like this. And then to play with that, so you stand, you see, you walk, you see, and then just seeing the contact and also seeing the tonality of pleasant, unpleasant, or neither. And then when you stop seeing something, what happened to the tonality? Does it go? Is there an echo? You can do the same thing with smell. Again, this depends. I find that when I am in an airport, <laughs> I do a lot of that. You know, when you walk through the airport and you have all the shop and all the perfume and everything, then, mm, then I kind of, you know, or if you're in an hospital, it's the same. So that mm, lots of smell. What's the contact with the smell? So just being aware of the smell or to be, I mean, eating when we eat, being aware of the taste. And again, our reaction to taste is so interesting. You get your little piece of chocolate cake, you eat the first spoon, and you're not even finished to chew on it. You're already thinking of getting a second piece. I mean, so interesting. And then also uh, with thought. I mean, thought is the same. You know, thought are information. So when we see it, also to be aware of thought, to be aware of language. What am I saying to myself? What is the tone of the thought? So actually all the senses can be part of the anchoring, can be part of the meditation, but I would say it depends on the context. On some context, it makes more sense than on others. Thank you, Lela. And later on, please feel free to ask more questions if you have. So we have got one uh, in the chat. And because uh, Frank uh, Frank Schumann's uh, internet connection is not stable, he asked me to read the question, Martin. Here it is. Uh, Standing at the edge, the way I understand it, entails precariousness, or even perhaps some danger also from others. It's an edge because we could fall. Thus, we might find ourselves to be shaky, uncertain, unbalanced. How can this way of creative listening or creative way of listening and speaking help us not only to not push others, but also to not be pushed ourselves? 
No, this is a good point. Because in a way, when I heard the standing at the edge, personally, I felt, I, I thought of a cliff, you know, and you have a cliff, and then you have people who go over to the cliff, and then you have people who kind of look a little further from the cliff. And then you have the kind of the, the sign saying, danger, don't get too close. <laughs> so in a way, yes, standing at the edge as is precariousness. And so personally, I feel that's where the meditation will help us because often we kind of go about our life and there is no cliff. And so we feel, in a way, we assume there is not going to be a cliff because we feel fine. Things are going fine, no problem. I mean, that's what happened to me. I, I was in the airport, kind of, you know, looking at shops, waiting for my uh, flight. And then I get the phone call. My mother fainted. She was taken by the... She's 96, taken to the emergency. And so kind of, okay, this is what happened. Oh, this, you know, I already kind of imagined her at death door and I was, mm. but then nothing to do. Really, there was nothing to do. I was in the airport and everybody else was working in France. And then when I arrived, I went to the hospital and stayed in A&E for a few hours. And she was fine. She was fine. I mean, relatively so, she was fine. And then we took her back. And so in a way, what do you do when suddenly something happened? Something happened unexpected. And to me, what meditation here, I would say meditative listening and speaking is when you are with others and together there is an edge. But in terms of being by oneself, at the edge is what am I telling myself? How am I using my resource? And so what we have to be careful is that when we are at the edge, because it's precarious, it's going to be unpleasant. If it's going to be unpleasant, generally there is going to be fear. And generally we can react in very kind of a way which kind of like is going to be fixated, is going to be kind of not very able to move. So we might not say the right thing, we might not do the right thing or whatever it might be. Sometimes we kind of get destabilized. So what is it that's going to help us not to be destabilized? And I think here, in terms of the meditation is really one of, of the key I see in the sitting posture. That the sitting posture help us to cultivate within ourselves actually a bodily kind of ground. So you can feel a part of your body, even if you're agitated in the heart, you could feel maybe in your seat, in your belly, some groundedness. You can take refuge in. But also, it seems to me that we have to remind ourselves, what is it that's going to help me with calm? What is it here that's going to help me with clarity? And so in a way to be careful, what am I thinking? How am I amplifying what's going on, which stop me from being clear? And so then I would say, sometimes one of the things, I would suggest is, is this true what I'm thinking? Is it always true? Or if something happened and you're really at the edge and there is kind of like, you could say something heroic is a little required. Instead of thinking, what is the most I can do right now? What is the least I can do right now? What is the least that I will move forward to instead of what's the most in that moment. Because if you say what's the most, generally you paralyze. But what's the least, generally we can do a little something. So that would be the two quality I would kind of in a way connect with. The groundedness 
And then this, being careful of the amplifying. And then again, also, you might have meant also how not to be pushed ourselves by ourselves, that's what I considered, but also by others. And to me, this is a really important quality. How can we not be infected by the fear of others? How can we ourselves not give fears to others? To me, this is a really important quality. I experienced this when long ago I used to go to South Africa and often the, unfortunately, the white people were very frightened and then they would make me frightened. And then everything became frightening. And then I was with my friend, with the, somebody who has no fear, but not foolhardy, but somebody who is fearless in existing right now. And as soon as I was with him, all the fear went. And that's often was something I think, how can I give, how can I be fearless in a wise way? And ca how can my fearlessness help others in a wise way? And then I come back to this groundedness, really this feeling of groundedness so that you don't push yourself and you're not pushed by others. Thank you, Frank, for the question. And if you would like to ask more, uh, yes, Frank is just posting that it sounds like a language Aikido, uh, maintaining or balance and stability by inner flexibility. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Frank. Uh, again, uh, we are waiting for questions. Maybe I can ask one, uh, Martin, in the meantime you referred to situations of standing at the edge that appear uh, more or less abruptly that uh, uh, happen uh, in a moment or happen without expectation. Uh, we also face many, many challenging situations with that type of standing at the edge that are permanent. Uh, and we also see many, many stressful people uh, around us many many reports uh, sharing that uh, stress is becoming a more and more wise, widespread factor even even depression in a way so how can we develop certain resilience uh, with this uh, creative listening to more permanent stresses or situations in life that would not appear abruptly but would stay for long yeah no no this is this is uh, another part is that i mean some people are living on the edge all the time if you are uh, if you have an illness uh, which is relatively continuous is kind of in a way what do you do in that situation because you you're always on the edge and you can be stressed by it or not. And so I think, again, I mean, one of the best book I read in terms of uh, illness is by Darlene Cohen, Finding the Joy in the Heart of Pain. And in a way how you were not ill, but then you become ill. And then one of the main stress is how can I come back to not being ill when you have an illness which is continued continuous, it was rheumatoid arthritis. And then what she really shows is that actually it's complex. And at times she's okay, at times she's really not okay, at times she will do meditation, at times she will eat ice cream, it will TV, etc. And to me, what she showed is complexity. When you have a recurring situation or relatively continuous situation is in a way, how can I help myself within the situation personally? Because you have personal situation and how can you be helped? And what was so interesting with um, uh, Paul Grossman, I don't know, I presume you know Paul Grossman and his work, and he did this study with patients who had MS. 
and he did the MBSR course of eight weeks. And actually what was the most efficacious was compassion. Compassion meditation was actually in a way more efficacious than mindfulness in terms of not amplifying things, but becoming friendly with the condition. So stress was much reduced. He's, he's, um, he wrote a little article for something I did on that. And it was so interesting in a way, kind of what was most efficacious was compassion, more than mindfulness itself actually, is changing your relationship. After of course, we have like uh, the ecological crisis, there is a war in Ukraine, there is uh, the difficulty with um, immigration, emigration, uh, there is so many conflict and so many people in a difficult situation. So I think in a way, again, with that, I would say we have to be careful to watch as little news as we can every day. I would say watch the news once a day. That's the first thing. And also, what is it that I can do now? What is it I can do now by myself? What is it I can do now with the people around me? How can I contribute to dialogue and cooperation? And so in terms of uh, stress, I think is what's, what's the conditions? Some people really live in a way are stressed in advance. And that I think we can work to some degree with that. But then some people are living in very difficult situation, either of poverty, either of cold, either of different situation. And in, how can we help them where they are? And each of us will be limited by what we can do in terms of many different aspects. Personally, I mean, if we talk about the person themselves when they are stressed, I think in a way, possibly meditation, if it suits them, possibly finding a good support system, if it can help them. And I would say one of the main things is trying not to amplify. And that's why I would go back to change. You see, I have a friend, she has a mental illness and so she gets in very intense state but through the meditation she has learned this will pass and also i can help myself that this will pass and also i think at one certain level we have to learn to to creatively engage with a certain level of sadness Sadness that there is a war, sadness that things, uh, ecologically things are not going in the right way. And we need to be able to be with the sadness. I think this is part of being human. Is can we be with the sadness, but not in such a way that we overwhelm, but by experiencing it, feeling compassion, for people who really also suffer. And then how do we do something about it in our own small ways? Because well, I think this is a big subject. But one point, one point, you know, when the, the study we did in Khan with the, the seniors. So I did this study three years with seniors and we taught them meditation. And these people had never meditated before. And then we taught them meditation and things like that. And there was this lady who was very shy, very shy, very fearful. And after nine months of doing the course, at one of the sharing we had, she said, it is strange, but people are much friendlier to me now. And we said, hmm. Nice. And I thought, are people friendlier? Is she friendlier? 
how is she less anxious? And she's able to see more their friendliness. To me, that was a really kind of a kind of a, a gem that moment. Thank you so much, Martin, for answering this complex and uh, difficult question as well. We still have time for some more questions, so please feel free to raise your hand. While waiting, I may ask another one then. Um, you were talking about uh, listening creatively in the context of speaking and also in the context of thinking. Um, you might have already given response to another or maybe a third layer of uh, who we are, uh, but maybe I can ask this question still uh, more specifically. How can we apply creative listening in our acting, in our in our actions, in our in our physical, I would say physical operations, not necessarily speaking or thinking, but physically behaving? A good one is work. Okay, a task. You have work to do, you have task to do. And then Listen to yourself. What are you doing? Are you present totally to what is going on now? Or are you actually doing what you're doing now, but thinking about what you're going to do next so that you are not actually here, but you only have here and already there? Once, uh, long ago when we were teaching in New Mexico, uh, kind of a working retreat, so people came before they went to work, we gave them some suggestions, then they worked, and then they came back and told us what happened in the day. And so my advice was be present, be fully present, being really, really present to what you are doing. Don't be ahead of yourself, just be as present as you can. And one lady came back and she said, that actually she always thought that it was more efficacious to be ahead of herself. She always thought in order to be efficient, I have to think about the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. That's the way to be efficient. And then she did just for a day to experiment. She did what I suggested, be really present, leave it. Next thing, really present, leave it. And she came back, she said, it was so much more efficient to be present. And I thought that was so interesting that actually it's kind of like, what are you doing with your mind? Are you really there or are you really ahead of yourself? And what does that create? So that's what I would say in terms of activity. And then that time also I said, it was very interesting. I said to somebody, uh, somebody else was asking about how to speak in working with others, you know. And so I said, you know, you when you go to work in your office with other people, what is the least you can do to make a difference? So she went and they were all doing pottery together in a public place. And when there was no people, they used to chat among themselves and say nasty things about other people. And as a Buddhist, a lady did not enjoy that, but never said anything. And then that time she thought, oh, maybe I can say something. Martin suggested I do something. So then she suggested gently, oh, could we, instead of, of talking about this, could we talk about this? And then she brought a much more positive subject a beneficial subject. And she said it totally changed the atmosphere by actually kind of noticing what's going on, listening to what's going on, and then what difference can I make? So that's the way I would uh, suggest. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, the very practical suggestions to all these questions we were raising. And there's one more from Lela uh, that she posted in the chat, but she can also raise it live aloud. And then we'll turn to Frank after that. Uh, sure. Thank you. You know, I just want to follow up on the difference um, between the outcomes of the mindfulness meditation and the compassion practices. You used the word that it was, uh, I'm paraphrasing, maybe it was more um, efficient, efficacious, efficacious for the change. And, and this is also, uh, I've heard a similar outcomes in other studies, and I'm just really curious. It really, um, yeah, I'm curious what, well, why? Why do you think that the compassion practices, what are the, how can we explain this difference? No, I think we have to put together the fact that it was mindfulness practice and compassion practice together. This is very important. But what we have to be careful about is that often the, the mindfulness practice are slightly misunderstood, not all the time, but sometimes, mindfulness actually unfortunately can lead to more judging so you use mindfulness to judge yourself or someone else i remember when i lived in a buddhist community we used to accuse each other <laughs> not to be mindful of compassion it was very interesting <laughs> you know and and so in a way i think that's why nowadays what i really emphasize is what I call a caring and careful mindfulness. And so what is in, important here is a compassion is important just in terms of bringing a friendly attitude, which is going to dissolve the inner criticism, the judgment. The mindfulness can help a little here, but it's kind of like a sharp sword. Sometimes people actually use a mindfulness with the judging. And so we have to be careful because it can be hijacked very easily. And so when you look at, when you bring specifically the compassion, the loving kindness, the rejoicing, then I think he's saying, this is not to judge yourself. This is to be present, but in a friendly way, in a kind way. And so you really, what I was so struck when we taught the senior and we also talk about compassion, they were like, why should we be compassionate to ourselves? Why should we be compassionate to ourselves when we ill? Like they felt guilty for being ill, that there was something wrong with them. And then after a while they got it and actually they did say they felt better for it. So it's really the attitude. I think it's really about what is it we're trying to kind of as an antidote. And so I think kind of like compassion, loving kindness is really an antidote to this kind of type of inner criticism. And so if you bring that to mindfulness, then I think the two together can be very powerful. So it's not that you have to abandon mindfulness to go for compassion, because if you look at all, I mean, what I was amazed, everybody was telling me of this self-compassion training. And then finally I got the book of it and I read it and I, it's mostly about mindfulness, but with this emphasis of friendliness. So it's not that you put mindfulness aside, it's that you bring more of that friendly quality to the mindfulness. So I think, Personally, I think they really complement each other and they kind of, kind of as a kind of being careful how, how one could veer into this uh, judgment. Thank you, Martin, for the clarification. Um, Frank is uh, following up our previous uh, discussion with another question. Um, can and how we learn this quality while, while we are at the edge? Or do we need a less edgy training space? Exactly. This is a very good point. You see, 
to me, in a way, when the mindfulness practice, awareness practice is going to help us see that what we experience, I mean, this is not scientific, but what we seem to experience is kind of something at a light level, something at a habitual level, something at an intense level. And often we only do something when it's intense. And when it's intense, generally it's too late and overwhelming and kind of difficult. So in a way, the mindfulness practice, the listening practice could also help us first to be aware of the light. And then we can see how things change in an easier way. And then with the habitual, we can see we're not always like this, but they can be trigger, contributing factors, certain condition, which make us react a certain way. And then we can, you know, maybe try to sleep better, or we try to be less tired, or whatever it might be. And then when something intense happened, we know that actually possibly not to accept is going to happen, is going to last a certain time, and how within that can we create space so that we actually have a, like a, a different creative response. With the light stuff, we can actually watch it pass. It's very interesting. That's one of the questions I ask myself often. I feel something different. How long is this going to last? If it passes quickly, I don't need to worry about it. If, oh, this again, what's going on? What are the conditions? How can I help it? If it's intense, I have to wait a little bit for it to pass through the whole body. So I would agree, yeah. I think in a way, part of the meditation is to cultivate it in a less edgy space. And then we can have more muscle of groundedness, of clarity, when we are in a more difficult space. Thank you, Frank, for the question and Martin for the answer. And uh, I'm turning to Johanna. I have a great question posted in the chat already, but please share it live. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I was just um, really um, struck by this turn of phrase that you used earlier on, and you said we need to have a more creative relationship to sadness and our sadness in relation to the the state of the world and and otherwise. And I would love to hear um, more of your thoughts about the relationship between fear and sadness, because it seems to me that the edge that we're often presenting to the world and um, what really makes us into edgy creatures and what makes many situations feel quite edgy to us as humans is that um, is that quality of fear. And I was just thinking about how um, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche would often talk about how underneath all fear, all forms of fear was a fundamental form of sadness um, as a sort of basic condition of being human. And I'm just wondering how you how you um, not just think about that, but also work with those sort of two qualities in relation to what you were saying earlier. Yeah, personally, the way I would see um, fear and sadness, I see them as creative function of the organism. So it's totally human to have fear, it's totally human to have sadness. And I think it's very important to have fear and to have sadness. I mean, that's what makes us human. And then the difficulty is when they become really habituated in a certain way and amplified. So for me, fear is a survival mechanism. You just say, it's kind of like, it's thanks to fear that we are here, actually. Uh, because if there had been no fear, I don't think we would have evolved and arrived where we are at. So fear is very important. But then fear can happen. A fear is a very kind of like uh, physical, for me, emotional, are very physical. So I would connect them to the body. And so fear is like, you know, you're kind of paralyzed or you have different things, but to kind of, how does it feel? And we fear is really what's going on in the mind. Is it just a nervous system reacting because there is a good reason to be afraid and then what can I do? Or 
am I afraid? Because actually I am forecasting. I am afraid in advance. And I had a friend who had a very interesting experience with fear. From the age of 30, he was so afraid. He was so afraid that if his mother died, so his life would be finished. It would be a catastrophe and everything. So he always had that fear. If she dies, if she dies. And then it happened and he was totally fine. Because in that moment, in experience, he could creatively engage with it. So I think fear, we have to check. Is it true? Is it not true? What can be done? In terms of sadness, personally, I think sadness is actually our normal functioning in meeting pain, in meeting suffering. And so for me, sadness is very connected to compassion. We have sadness because we, we are uh, a creature who has a heart. So we are sad. And so sadness is kind of like, um, it's kind of what I would call normal human, etc. But again, what we have to see is we generally are sad because let's say, there is suffering or because there is a loss. And then there is what I would call the bodily experience of sadness. And the bodily experience of sadness is generally to cry, for example. And so if somebody died, my father died, my brother died, and each time it was the same. For a year and a half, I would cry at the odd time. And so you have what I would call the sadness, which is a physical sadness because something has happened, which then over time will go down a little bit, but still be there. And then it will become what I would call a human sadness, that you've lost somebody, but you won't have any more of that bodily reverberation. So, and also I think sadness puts us in touch with the suffering of the world. And so to me, it's very connected to compassion, to kind of feeling for being available to the suffering of the world without being overwhelmed by it. But there is also sadness where things don't go that way. So then you could have a sadness, which is more like kind of what we call little, not depression as an illness, but kind of you feel a little down. You feel a little heavy. You're like, oh, you know, this is interesting, that feeling of, because oh. it's very kind of feel a little like sadness, but it's like, oh. things are not going the way I want it to be. Oh. And recently I had that. It was fascinating because uh, we're doing a course and then there was some meat feedback of the course and some of the <laughs> It's kind of negative. And so for two days, I was feeling like, Whoa. I mean, it was not about me, but still, I was feeling like, kind of like, oh, I was like, oh. And then after two days, I thought, I'm going to see them in a week. Let's do something a little different. And then boom, the energy came back up. But I think it's very normal, sadness, heaviness, when in a way you kind of like, oh. I wish it were otherwise. I think it's also saying that. But again, it's a complex subject. Thank you, Martin. This this meeting was certainly not that course. <laughs> uh, this was not uh, making us feel down. It was making us feel uplifted. Absolutely uplifted. Uh, Ida may ask another short question, please. Thank you. I will try to be really short. I wonder if you have a tip for me, Martin. I'm currently working with a, an international group on something your husband knows very well. It's his project, actually, the cartography of care. And we have many meetings online. We don't know each other. We all come from a mindfulness background. And um, there's a lot of email writing going on. And I feel that 
because we all come from different cultures and actually have different levels of understanding and writing in English, that there's a lot of room for misunderstandings and a lot of room for reactivity, actually. I can see it in myself and I try to refrain from it, but I wonder if you have any tips on how working in such a diverse group um, practicing, really speaking and listening and writing meditation. <laughs> uh, be careful with reply all. Mm -hmm. First thing, kind of, ca ca can you get some kind of, you know, simplify, kind of try to be really careful. Does everybody needs to reply all, all the time to everybody to the same degree? Kind of simplify that. Then I would say, I mean, to be careful because some people, I mean, I don't personally, I'm always amazed. Some people can read you like a kind of, you know, a page or two page of email. And you think, you know, where do they find the time to do this? And some other don't have the time. So in a way, it's going to be a little unbalanced into the one who kind of are so happy to and the one who kind of don't have the time to And so I think to be careful to do not do everything by email, but to try to keep it simple as much as you can. Simplicity should be kind of like maybe on every email, simplify, simplify. And also uh, when you speak with each other, I don't know, could you have little breakout groups or do something where you get to know each other a little bit? Also, I learned a wonderful quote. Patience is art of being out of instrumental time. And I think what maybe all of you need to do is can we be patient in terms of time? We don't have to create this in the next 10 minutes. This is not going to save the world in 10 minutes either. So can we take the time? Can we not be too rushed? Because I think if you rush, it's kind of like, we need, we need, we need. Can we kind of, again, take your time? Mm -hmm. If you can take your time, I don't know what the kind of the framework is, but I think to remind each other of patience. Patience is a great quality. But if you wanted, we could talk separately somewhere. <laughs> that might be helpful. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm really there for you anytime. Oh, thank you. Thanks. So um, I think our time is up. Mm, yes, but we are going to yes, end this meeting not too rushed. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Martin, for your uh time for your presence for your wisdom for your teaching and suggestions and very practical tips it was it was really extraordinary to hear you tonight and i hope i can uh, translate this uh, this message from uh, on behalf of us all here so a big thank you and uh, <clears throat> johanna may i invite you to also uh, say a few words and Thank Martin and also uh, on behalf of us all at MLE, uh, thanking you all for following us throughout the whole year as this was our last uh, public gathering this year. Yes, thank you so much, Martin, for this offering, which helped us to close the year and not just the year, but also the theme, this banner theme that we had at MLE, which was standing at the edge. And I think you really drew out um, some threads that gave us some inspiration and um, a sense of also the, the the hopefulness that we can have in in terms of what we can practice. Um, and we will be back next year with more online programming. So um, please stay tuned and we will continue the Mind Matter series. It's a quarterly series um, open to the wide uh, listenership on YouTube and to the general public. So um, you are more than welcome to join us for the next next season. And we were also very happy to have started with Stephen Batchelor as the first speaker of the Mind Matter series this year and to end with Martin. So thank you for bringing us full circle, uh, Martin. And we hope to see you again at another time. Thank you.
Keep well, everybody. Keep well, please. Thank you.